Perhaps the greatest lie ever perpetrated on populations all over the world is the condensation trail lie. What we're seeing in our skies is not condensation. It's sprayed particulate dispersions with very few exceptions. Now they shouldn't be there. Jet engines burn clean. So if there's anything coming out of them, it's an additive. They're absolutely not contrails. Contrails do not linger, dissipate, and go into cloud coverage, period, in the report. And I kept saying to people, you know, what is this? Because now the sky is no longer blue, it's starting to turn gray. And what I found was it's kind of like it was not socially acceptable. You know, we're all going to pretend this is not really happening. And I thought, oh, this is very bad. Most are unfamiliar with a science term called global dimming. That term refers to the amount of direct sunlight that no longer reaches the surface of the planet due to light scattering particles that are building up in the atmosphere. And although many of these particles are from industrialized pollution, the larger majority are from the ongoing climate engineering solar radiation management operations. This engine, a high bypass turbofan jet engine, this is the engine that is on all military takers and all commercial carriers, is in essence a jet powered fan. 90% of the air that moves through this engine is non-combusted. This engine by design is nearly incapable of producing any condensation trail except under rare and extreme circumstances. And again, you know, we have film footage of aircraft flying at altitude with nozzles visible, turning on and off. That is the end of the argument. Since even before man could fly, there was an effort to try to modify the weather. We have weather modification patents going back a hundred years plus. These are historical films of what can be done with a biplane, a small biplane that carries a very small payload. And that much can be done. How much more? Can a fully loaded military tank or KC-10, KC-135, C-17 Globemaster, how much more material can they put in the air? About 500 times more with a single tanker. In regard to the condensation trail narrative, many refer back to the trails left by World War II bombers as proof that we are only seeing condensation trails in our skies. But geoengineeringwatch.org found on military archives film footage which we posted of World War II B-17s at altitude, turning off a sprayed dispersion. We know that climate engineering was deployed immediately after World War II, so testing was absolutely ongoing. Clearly, these bombers were used for beta testing. Film footage proves it. Weather was a weapon used over Vietnam. Would you expect that to be then deleted from the availability? No. To continue to expand the scientific aspects of it, to have it available in your portfolio of weapons would be a natural process. Therefore, should you expect that it is available on demand to have the ability to modify weather? Absolutely, within this country and others. Climate engineering is the crown jewel of the military industrial complex. Climate engineering has been used to destabilize and topple nations all over the globe, facilitating military occupations by hostile countries like the US. We know that some of these countries are having their precipitation cut off because they have stated so on the floor of the UN, like the president of Iran stating emphatically that NATO weather modification programs were cutting off the precipitation to Iran, but US media never covered it. We have an economic model operating globally, which is operating based on covert force. And I have very serious questions after watching the financial patterns as to whether that financial force or that force includes weather warfare. People were coming to me telling me about this. So because of that, I went to the government in Ottawa under freedom of information. It was a 40 page report of which half the pages were completely blank and the other half had a lot of blank outs. But there was sufficient information to tell me that, yeah, they're aware.
they call it geoengineering. One of the big problems is that when we find some new technology, we get all excited by it, by the, the potential benefits of that technology, and often implement it and, and use the technology before we have any idea of the negative effects. Shouldn't it be considered that every breath we take is laden with highly toxic particles that are wreaking havoc in our own bodies? Particles that aren't being reported by any air quality testing systems. Any official air quality testing are looking for PM10 or PM2.5, 2.5 microns at best. The climate engineering nanoparticulates are exponentially smaller. They go virtually unreported. These nanomaterials generate reactive oxygen species in biological materials, damage tissue, lead to advanced aging, cause cancer, causative agents of dementia. So, yeah, we might think that we're doing something positive for humanity to save our species, but we're also poisoning ourselves. Eventually, with the team that we formed at geoengineeringwatch.org, we were able to acquire a NOAA flying lab. We were able to test at altitude to confirm the elements that were showing up at the surface. Our intention was to do a point-to-point -point sampling mission. We could see these obvious patterns that were being laid out in the sky. We were really thankful for the opportunity to be able to get up to altitude. And on the return mission, we noticed that that cloud layer had descended. And we sampled below the cloud layer, we sampled through that confluent layer and above it. We found exactly the same elements listed in climate engineering patents. The same elements we found on countless surface tests of precipitation from all over the globe. Governments all over the globe and the entire climate science community are telling the population urgently that climate engineering operations, solar radiation management operations need to be immediately deployed to try to mitigate the warming of our planet, to try to preserve what's left of its life support systems. And yet when the public, those that are awake, try to bring to the attention of academia and elected officials that we see climate engineering already being conducted in our skies all over the globe. It's already been deployed. Lab tests prove it, film footage proves it, documents prove it. And yet we have the continued denial from the climate science community and official agencies telling us that we're not really seeing what we're seeing in the skies. They tell us if climate engineering were deployed, it would look exactly like what we're seeing in our skies. But then again, they tell us that we're not really seeing what we are actually seeing. The paradox is the more the climate engineers spray the planet, destroy the ozone layer, disrupt the hydrological cycle, and increase the overall warming of the planet. The more they feel they have to ramp these programs up to try to mitigate some of the damage that these programs have done in the first place. That is the true definition of insanity. As a society, we are uh, like a freight train heading for a broken bridge that uh, is just a few years away from us. And, and I think people don't uh, understand the exponential increase of uh, toxicity in the environment. These operations should be considered the most insane endeavor ever deployed by the human race. These operations are systematically derailing all of Earth's life support systems. In the attempt to blot out the sun, the myopic short-term objective of trying to cool the planet while worsening the overall warming, the climate engineers if these operations are allowed to continue, are pounding the nails into our collective coffins. From a scientific perspective, and what we know about nanomaterials and their effect on human health and the environment, this is a serious problem. And it really does warrant further scientific investigation. We need the answers to get to the bottom of this national security problem. If populations around the globe find out 
what has been done to them by their governments without their knowledge or their consent. There will be a shockwave around the globe that cannot be contained by the criminal governments that have now taken control of our planet and civilizations all over the world. Just bringing transparency will shift so many things that it will make it extremely difficult because you cannot manage an entire planet with overt force, only with covert force. If we bring transparency to who it is in the covert force, it shifts everything. Look at your own health and you know what is going on. And if you love your children, join us in, in fighting what we need to fight. This is a just fight, it's the right fight, it's the right cause. And if the climate engineering operations, which are derailing Earth's life support systems, are not immediately exposed and halted, all other challenges for the human race become moot because the planet will no longer support life. We are in completely uncharted territory. Virtually the entire web of life is being systematically contaminated and decimated by the ongoing climate engineering operations. On top of all other forms of human activity or anthropogenic activity that are wreaking havoc in the web of life, climate engineering, mathematically, statistically speaking, is the single greatest and most immediate threat we collectively face short of nuclear cataclysm. Sounds like pure science fiction, but there is a growing underground movement of people who believe that our harsh drought is part of a government conspiracy. Here, outlandish ideas like weather warfare and climate engineering, in other words, weather control, are accepted as basic fact. Climate engineering is the greatest single assault on the environment ever launched by humanity, without question. Dane Wigginton, lead researcher for Geoengineering Watch, is sounding the alarm. Climate engineering, they say, is to blame for the harshest recorded drought in California history. Dane is used to skeptics. He once was one himself. Talk is cheap for those that haven't investigated. I didn't want to believe this either. His background is in solar power, but he started investigating on his own about a decade ago. After becoming suspicious, something was partially blocking the sun's energy from reaching his solar home. I grew up in Southern California, choking in a sea of smog. None of the adults around me seemed concerned about the conditions, but for me, life in the toxic murk was intolerable. I have always fully recognized the immense damage being inflicted on the planet by countless forms of human activity. I lectured on anthropogenic global warming. I dreamt of clean air and blue skies. I dreamt of living in untainted wilderness, off the grid. I dreamt of planting trees and watching them grow and thrive. I dreamt of coexisting with the wild inhabitants of the forest. I finally made it to the serene setting I had craved for so long. A remote forested mountaintop in Northern California. But the dream soon turned to a nightmare. When I began to lose significant amounts of my solar power uptake, from my off-grid wilderness home, I knew something was radically wrong. We are officially told that the aircraft emitted trails in our skies that linger, spread, and sometimes cover the entire horizon are just condensation. But the condensation trail narrative is perhaps the greatest lie ever perpetrated on populations all over the world. It is not possible for condensation to block at times 60, 70, even 80% of my solar power uptake. I began to research the issue of geoengineering, aka climate engineering, programs that governments around the globe and in climate science communities have told us are only proposals. Yet, there they were, in the skies above me. Even today we are being told, falsely, by the climate science community that we have one final card to play to try to avert total climate collapse, total planetary meltdown, but this is in fact a lie. Climate engineering, weather modification patents go back more than 100 years. But all available data indicates that programs were first deployed at scale immediately after World War II and deployed over the polar regions in the attempt to increase the size of the polar ice packs and thus try to regulate Earth's temperatures. It lays the predicate and the foundation for the development of a weather satellite that will permit man to determine the world's cloud layer and ultimately to control the weather, and he who controls the weather will control the world. Numerous government documents posted at geoengineeringwatch.org. 
some as much as 800 pages long, prove that global governments, even governments that the public perceives as being adversarial, are in fact colluding and cooperating on the climate engineering issue due to the cross-border ramifications. You can't climate engineer over your own country without affecting the entire planet. They are all working together on these issues and other governments around the globe are either actively or passively cooperating. Is the government experimenting with our weather? People say the government is up there in airplanes spraying all kinds of chemicals to change or manipulate the weather. It is called geoengineering, fighting global warming by putting a chemical dust in the atmosphere and reflecting harmful radiation back into space. You could use barium oxide, for example, uh, which makes big fluffy clouds. You could use tiny little bits of aluminum, which is benign in the environment, and essentially manage the climate. There are 172 bills before the U.S. Senate right now calling for more weather modification programs. A Weather Modification Act calling for research in, quote, attempting to change or control by artificial methods the natural development of atmospheric cloud forms. My personal opinion is that we have to keep geoengineering on the table. We have to look at it very carefully because we might get desperate enough to want to use it. There is a line of research on what's called geoengineering, which are various techniques that would delay the heating to bias 20 or 30 years to get our act together. The stated goal of some of the world's most recognized geoengineers, like Dr. David Keith and Dr. Ken Caldera, is to put 10 to 20 million tons of nanoparticulates into global skies annually. That's an inconceivable amount of material. This material is on top of industrialized pollution. Right? This is about how we engineer the planet. It's about the fact, an uncomfortable fact, but it is a fact that we have the technical ability to do this. They are all fast acting, they are cheap, and they are fundamentally imperfect. And the problems of how you control something where an individual country can have tremendous leverage over the whole planet's climate, and where there are winners and losers in ways that, that really could be unpredictable, and I mean, not to frighten you, but I think you can imagine scenarios that lead to war. Another example is the array of technologies, often referred to collectively as geoengineering that potentially could help reverse the warming effects of global climate change. One that has gained my personal attention is stratospheric aerosol injection. There's all sorts of ways you could do this, uh, but the standard idea has always been spray sulfuric acid in the stratosphere 20 kilometers over our head and use that to stop the planet warming up. The example many people cite was when uh, the Mount Pinatubo volcano uh, exploded and uh, all of this ash went into the air and had a cooling effect on the Earth. And so people have long proposed since the mid-60s that you could artificially add dust to the stratosphere and cool the planet. Not that this would be a good solution for global warming, it would not. But it does show the way we're steadily developing the powers to manipulate the planet with comparative ease. That sulfur in the lower atmosphere is masking some mm -hmm. of the climate warming from CO2. So is this the global dimming or something? Yeah. Uh, their leading idea is basically to emulate what big volcanoes do, put material in the stratosphere to reflect sunlight. So the problem is the following. If you add SO2 to the stratosphere, SO2 doesn't condense. So you might want to put alumina in. Alumina has a very high nature of fraction. It's very small. It doesn't coagulate. And you can engineer particles that have particular properties. You can get them out of the stratosphere. You can concentrate particles near the poles. Costs are so cheap that the richest people on the planet could perhaps afford to buy an ice age. It's extraordinarily cheap. I knew it was cheap when I found that they were quoting me in tons. It's also true that particles, as they get bigger, fall out a lot faster. We sort of step back and think, okay, well, how would you actually make particles in the stratosphere? This is really engineering now. If it was aerosols in the stratosphere, it would likely be put there by airplanes. Start with a fleet of just two or three kind of modified business jets. The basic idea is that if you let a plume off in an aircraft by just changing some little details, you can actually get much smaller particle size distributions by doing this kind of spraying. So there are all sorts of side effects. I'll get to them in a second. But, but if you put sulfuric acid in the stratosphere, for example, you could deplete stratospheric ozone. Smaller size means more surface area, uh, uh, but more surface area means less ozone. Oh, uh, is the stuff in the stratosphere going to be killing some number of people that are going to be so we just, sacrificed? It, it's, a, it's an obvious concern. <laughs> if it kills a million people and we're only bad. doing 1% more, we're just killing 10,000 more people. You can do math. Okay. But that's, so, so killing people is not the objective here. <laughs> so if I made a decision or if there was a collective decision to do a geoengineering program, and you put, say, uh, the kind of program I think makes more sense, we put about a million tons a year in, but let's say, 
you might end up killing many tens of thousands of people a year as a direct result of that decision. And so the only thing that we can do to cool the planet or that society can do to cool the planet is deploy these sorts of technologies. And by the way, it's not really a moral hazard. It's more like free riding on our grandkids. And it means there are going to be winners and losers, just like there are winners and losers for CO2, but there are different winners and losers. So this makes the problem, if anything, harder to solve. You've introduced another dimension of complexity into the managing the planet's climate problem. What we're watching financially is a great deal of public policy being promoted on the theory that we have climate change. And yet in that discussion, we never talk about, well, what's all this spraying and how is that involved? Engineering the weather gives you the ability to overcome or prevent droughts. It gives you the ability to inflict them if you don't go along. And the brilliance of inflicting a drought is there's no popular support against you. So this kind of invisible warfare, if it can be done, is very effective, it would seem to me, both positive and negative. Well, imagine if you can predict the weather over long periods of time, how much money you can make. You know, you can trade it. How do you manage money in that world? Many people message me confused and bewildered as to how it is possible that such colossal programs can occur in skies above our heads, programs of climate engineering and solar radiation management that are literally decimating Earth's life support systems. And these programs are not being acknowledged by any official source, not being acknowledged by the climate science community that has indeed betrayed the human race and the entire web of life by their denial of the ongoing climate engineering elephant in our skies. And the people that message me are perplexed at how such atrocities can be ongoing for so many decades. And we have still official denial and we have populations that are all too willing to accept that denial. I began to test for some of the primary elements named in climate engineering solar radiation management patents, starting with aluminum, barium, and strontium. My test came back from the state certified lab. To my dismay, these elements indeed were present in significant amounts and subsequent tests showed higher and higher and higher amounts, continuing to escalate until one test was as high as 3,450 parts per billion of aluminum. This is highly toxic rain. I knew my life would never be the same because I can't look the other way. It's completely intolerable for me to live under toxic skies. And what about the trees? What about the bats, the bears, the birds, the bees? They have no voice except for us. I began to try to bring this issue to light from that moment on. Initially, few would listen, few would look at the data. But as time went on and as more and more people woke up along the way and realized the significance of attempting to play God with the weather and engineer Earth's life support systems. More individuals from different arenas joined the effort to try to sound the alarm. I want to tell you that we're in very great danger from the pollution that's coming down over us. And we've been led astray by the military industrial complex and they're responsible for the clouds creation and weather manipulation programs. I sacrificed four years of my life defending the people of my country just to come home and find there are greater threats here domestically. There's something going on. I don't know who it is or why they're doing it. All I can testify is it's not natural and it's not normal. Now the aluminum content of rain should be zero. And uh, there's a lot of argument that aluminum is very common to be found. But aluminum is only common in a bonded form. It's not common in a free form and we're finding high rates of free aluminum because you can spread so many small little particles through the environment it dramatically increases the surface area that's in that environment because there's so many of them when you look up at the sun and you see a white haze that is aluminum floating in the air right now and it's coming from the aircraft solar radiation management SRM to block the sun that's the stated purpose the, the consequences don't seem to be considered with these programs, but that is the stated purpose on almost all UN and global governance documents for these programs. And in the past five years, I have seen the number of patients with Alzheimer's disease, Parkinson's, and other neurodegenerative diseases tremendously increase, almost quadruple. United States Code says you cannot experiment on the American public, and if you do, you got to report it to Congress within 30 days. Where's the proof that you did that? 
but is also to get the media to start reporting on this. So all of us have a consequence that we may not be aware of, and it is important for all of us to join together and to put a stop to these programs and to hold public discussions on them for as much as possible. And I want all of you to know that it's important that we realize that this is not normal and natural, that these are programs, experimental programs that are being conducted at this time, and we all have to stand up and say no. This tank can be used for disseminating all types of agents. Anti-crop spray from aircraft using the Aero X2A has proved very effective in field trials. For larger planes, the Air Force has perfected spray equipment. This B-17 has several spraying nozzles and carries the tank in the bomb bay. I'm Charles Jones, Brigadier General, U.S. Air Force, retired. In the years 1953 through 1962, I was stationed in Germany. Then we moved to England in 1959 while assigned to the 42nd Tactical Reconnaissance Squadron with dual missions of electronic countermeasures and weather reconnaissance. We also had the responsibility of reporting jet engine contrails throughout our area of responsibility in Europe, North Africa, the Mediterranean, and Eastern Atlantic. We were responsible for pinpointing the exact altitudes of all jet engine contrails noted within the flying area of responsibility in both the weather and ECM aircraft missions. We became experts on jet engine aircraft contrails and all of their characteristics. Much different from the white aircraft spray trails that consist of scientifically verifiable strain of aluminum particles and other toxic heavy metals, polymers, and chemical components. These are the long white spray trails that linger and slowly expand into light cloud cover that soon cover entire areas with an overcast, very light cloud cover. We're never going to get to the bottom of climate change until everything is laid on the table about geoengineering and the disasters that it can and is causing. My name is Richard Rolig. I served a career of 34 years in the United States Air Force. I was able to achieve the rank of Major General. I was in the acquisition business developing new weapon systems and did lead one major top secret program for three years. During the 10 years I worked at Raytheon, the exposure to various programs was limited to what they wanted you to work on. So even though I still had the top secret clearance and certain programs I got exposed to, that was not one of them. That was compartmentalized as it should be. And unless you had a direct impact or you were personally involved in it, you would not have received that particular clearance. It goes back to around October of 17. I'm residing near an Air Force base here in Tucson, Arizona, Davis Montham Air Force Base. Aircraft exiting, doing their flight training, etc. And having lived around Air Force my whole life, my father even being a pilot, it became obvious to me that the contrails that were coming out of some of the aircraft in the local area were not normal looking. They took on a different texture, they spread differently. And so as a result, I started talking to a couple ex-pilots that are part of the organizations, asked them to look at it. My wife is a pilot. I had brought her out of the house. We looked at the contrails and it was obvious that they were not normal. So as a result, we started doing a little research you yeah, called it the elephant in the sky. I mean, everybody on the planet is looking up and seeing this kind of spraying going on. I became involved in weather modification uh, analysis uh, due to my background uh, as a weather observer in the United States Air Force. And as I was looking at the jet clouds in the sky, I realized that that's certainly not normal. 
And so I've been watching these abnormal clouds for a long time. Well, I started to learn about geoengineering just in a very personal way. I uh, decided to leave Washington in 1998. I bought a, a small property in a farming community in Tennessee, and I still had business in Washington, and so I would drive back and forth between Tennessee and Washington, but I was also driving around the country networking with a variety of people trying to understand what was going on in the economy. And as I was driving around, I saw this spring, and literally you had planes crisscrossing in very unusual patterns back you know they'd fly back and forth and you get this tapestry of crisscross spraying that would just hang in the sky for a long time as an investment person you're adding it up in your mind you know okay we have two planes over this county flying this many hours and spraying this much stuff this is very expensive <laughs> who's paying for this and i was doing a lot of research at the time on a great deal of money that was going missing from the federal government on a covert basis. On one hand, you have all this money going missing. And on the other hand, you have this fantastically expensive spraying program going on. The ongoing global climate engineering operations must be considered a new Manhattan project on a scale that is almost inconceivable. Governments all over the globe are either actively or passively participating in the ongoing climate engineering insanity, all for their own reasons, all in the attempt to keep business as usual until the last possible moment. Geoengineering is occurring, it's been occurring, it is not new, and your tax dollars are funding this. Well, my name is um, Kristen Megan Edwards. I am a U.S. Air Force veteran. I served nine years on active duty working in bioenvironmental engineering. So upon my separation, which was honorably, I went and worked for the VA in the Veterans Health Administration as an industrial hygienist and an environmental specialist. So as an industrial hygienist, my job was to protect people from such things as heavy carcinogenic metals and hazardous materials. And through that, all items that came on base was approved through what is called an Air Force Form 3952. And that is a hazardous materials acquisition. So in order for a chemical to be brought on base, it had to be tied to a specific task. If people were painting aircraft, we knew where that paint was going and what it was being used for. And this was all for liability. So when you start to find constituents coming on the base that you're trying to remove from the base, and engineer out through different industrial processes. That was a red flag for me and really told me to do my own research. I've often wondered with the large amount of people in all branches of the military who work in an environmental facet, why they aren't coming forward. I don't think a lot of people are connecting the dots. Now, I wouldn't have stumbled upon why these constituents were being brought on base unless I had heard about geoengineering. So a lot of times I think people are supporting an operation but haven't really seen the outside information to tie it to why this is going on. To see how much taxpayer dollars are used in military operations, whether they're peacetime or wartime, to see how much money is spent to reduce hazards, again, that affect human health and impact the environment, is a complete contradiction to geoengineering using wartime exemptions to not be cited through the EPA. This is a huge waste. This is fraud and waste from the U.S. government. And that this is allowed to go on to me is unbelievable. I think it's one of the uh, most dangerous, diabolical things that uh, has ever happened to us. It's the most dangerous thing uh, short of a nuclear cataclysm. So I take it very, very seriously and will do everything I can to try and expose the uh, problem and encourage people to do likewise. Well, when I was growing up, I was really a fan of Kurt Vonnegut, and Kurt wrote some remarkable works. And I later learned that most of the fodder for that work came from the work of his brother, Bernard Vonnegut, who was a scientist at the GE under Irving Langmuir, the lead scientist there. That work was focused on the production of ice crystals at elevated temperature using a compound called silver iodide. I would like to take you into the laboratory and show you a few of the experiments that led us to our outdoor experiments in converting clouds into snow. These are some which I photographed that were formed in the laboratory. This is a picture of the first cloud that we seeded back last November. Putting dry ice from a small dispenser in the bottom of the plane, under many conditions of course, full-fledged snowstorms will be produced in this way. Nature at last has permitted to do a little something about the weather. These were something that scientists had worked on, developed through the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. 
and was likely being deployed even today. The research done by Vonnegut and Langmuir coincided with changes in our sky. As these programs, or at least this type of research increased, the skies started to change. My first real observation of those changes and real awareness of it came. I was looking up and saw patterned skies of these uh, trails that were being laid out by planes, then developing into confluent layers that would drift perhaps hundreds of miles, changes the weather, changes the temperature around you, also the light intensity and the quality of light was changing. And it was funny that there was not really a lot of published literature on this material. There had been some governmental reports that I had uh, dug into. There was some evidence that this type of research was being conducted. And in fact, there was a presentation that was given where Dane Wigginton asked some questions about the materials that they were discussing and their possible role in weather modification programs. Numerous air quality studies, uh, including from the uh, CARB California Air Quality Resource Board, have named submicron sized particulates as being particularly harmful for human respiration. Through all the discussions today, uh, I have not heard any mention of this fallout, and has, has this been studied, and also the effects of a highly reactive metal like aluminum on toxifying soils and waters. The question is, what would be the effects of these materials on human health? They came down into the stratosphere. Yeah, environment. In, uh, in, in particular, uh, small particles and aluminum. We, in our climate model, we looked at how much additional acid rain, acid, acid snow you would get from the sulfur coming out of the stratosphere if you did it at a rate of five megatons per year or 10 megatons per year of sulfate. And it turns out, that amount is so much smaller than what humans put in the troposphere on an annual basis by burning fossil fuels as a byproduct. That even in pristine areas, the soil would have a burning capacity and the, it wouldn't be harmful. So, so. so the, the collaborators that I'm working on the aerosol scheme are actually folks from Carnegie Mellon who focused on human health impacts. And while we haven't published it, that was the very first thing we did, was do the order of magnitude calculation that will have some paper but with an expert on human health impacts about whether there could be an issue. And the answer is no clear cut no. So for the numbers of particles burning the stress here are so tiny compared to the loadings on human health. There are other things that worry me a lot, like the rain on these particles in the upper troposphere when they might affect high clouds. And, and for aluminum or other particles, there are a lot of toxicological things that need to get looked at seriously. But if you just think about the sheer number of particles and the human health impact of small particles, the answer is, well, we haven't published it. That was the first thing we looked at with some of the leading experts who do uh, epidemiological research on the human health impacts, and it's not even close to the issue. 10 megatons of aluminum dumped into the, the uh, atmosphere would have no human health impacts. So, so let me be more careful here. We're to separate out the toxicological, but so the aluminum, we've only begun to research and publish nothing. The question I was asking was about purely about particle number density. So what we did is we said, we looked at some global estimates now we have of, 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 of aerosol, global estimates that were built for epidemiological purposes of the global loading of aerosols in terms of health impacts. And we said if we added on top of that what we're doing from the stratospheric aerosols, could it have any impact? And the answer is that that was totally irrelevant. But that was just on particle number. We haven't done anything serious on Illumina, and so there could be something terrible that we'll find tomorrow we haven't looked so after I saw that footage, uh, I contacted Dane and I started asking him some questions myself because I was interested in what he knew already. I mean, he was very forthcoming with all types of information. I realized that he had published a lot of material online and I started perusing that material and uh, found that, you know, he was digging at something where there was, a, again, a lack of available scientific evidence, and that's where I became quite interested in contributing in any way that I could. I then, working further with Dane, and with great thanks to our contributors, uh, was able to take a number of flights where we could sample through these condensation trails or these confluent layers that had been laid out earlier in the day, so on the first sampling mission, we started at the Baltimore-Washington International Airport. 
The University of Maryland has a twin engine Cessna that is a flying laboratory. It has a sampling nozzle at the front of the plane that collects air samples prior to any contact with the plane or the engines or anything behind. Those samples are then taken through a tube, passed through a filter cassette, and these filters are glass fiber filters that are pretty large pore space filters that uh, do effectively capture ground pollution. So PM 2.5, those particle sizes are 2.5 microns, and they've done a really good job of it. But it's not really the proper equipment to completely evaluate the number of particles that might be smaller than that. And we're talking 10 to 100 times smaller than the PM 2.5 particles. But those do capture some of them. And we flew in a, an air-controlled zone and basically flew big circles trying to get to altitude, but the control towers wouldn't actually allow us uh, to reach the altitude that we needed. They basically want you to pass through that zone. The second flight that we conducted was flown from BWI to Albany International Airport. All right, we're just in pre-flight here. This morning, we witnessed well, we observed emissions from several planes, several high altitude planes, flying between 25 and some up to 40,000 feet. And the trails that were left behind these uh, planes spread out into a confluent layer. And the low angle of the sun in the morning allowed for us to observe the uh, polarizing effects of those particles using simple polarizing lenses. We could see these obvious patterns that were being laid out in the sky. We were really thankful for the opportunity to be able to get up to altitude that we could observe these materials and sample that cloud layer. Our intention was to do a point-to-point -point sampling mission where we could actually reach altitudes you know, approaching 20,000 feet. Unfortunately, on our flight from BWI to Albany, the layer that we observed was at 27,000 feet, and I think we made it to about 23,000 feet, perhaps, and so we were below that confluent layer that we observed. We landed, had lunch, they refueled the plane. We have two uh, blanks of control samples. One was taken prior to the flight, one was taken after the flight. So we should have, again, two um, blank samples and actually three samples, one as on ascent, one at level flight, and then slight ascent from 17,000 to 21,000, and then changed the filter and uh, filtered, took another sample, a third sample, uh, as we descended. And then on the return mission, though, we noticed that that cloud layer had descended from 25 or 27,000 feet to about 17,000 feet. So we could easily reach through that and we sampled below the cloud layer. And I'm saying cloud, I mean an induced cloud layer. We sampled through that confluent layer and above it. The basic building blocks of climate engineering are to saturate the atmosphere with electrically conductive light scattering particles and polymers, particles like aluminum, barium, strontium, manganese. These particles are then manipulated with extraordinarily powerful radio frequency microwave transmissions. Transmissions that can heat the upper layers of the atmosphere like the ionosphere that are used to create pressure zones that steer upper level wind currents which then steer weather systems. These particulates, when they are manipulated with these frequencies, can literally move air masses. This is an integral part of climate engineering that is not known or being acknowledged by many. Extraordinarily powerful and dangerous radio frequency microwave transmissions. Electromagnetic fields are energy sources, and they're going to be interacting with moisture in the air or our bodies or whatever. And therefore, it's not at all surprising that you're going to find some movement in, in relation to exposure of weather patterns to electromagnetic fields. When you have things like HARP that can send electromagnetic waves into the air column, 
if you send, you know, lower frequencies, you can calm it all down and you can cool it. Or you can excite it and you can heat it up. So there's complete control of temperature within the environment. In 1985, Bernard Eastland applied for patents. Many claim that these patents have become the blueprint for HARP, High Frequency Active Auroral Research Program. HARP is, uh, is a large antenna where we beam radio frequency energy up into the upper atmosphere. Applications uh, discussed in the patents included destroying missiles. Communications control and disruption were included. There were some other ideas both to possibly modify weather. What we can do with an antenna is change the, the portion of the sky into which we insert the energy. HARP's combined antennae generate a focused billion-watt high-frequency radio beam, which penetrates the lower ionosphere and interacts with the currents of the auroral electrojet. In certain applications, the military acknowledges that it can literally lift the ionosphere, and what they say is, it's not a problem, it's a short period of time, yet when you lift the ionosphere up, the lower atmosphere rushes in and fills that void, which changes localized weather patterns. At its biggest size suggested, if you beamed it for an hour and a half, that would equal the energy in a hydrogen bomb. HARP is only one installation of perhaps a hundred that are on that scale around the globe. You can create high pressure domes. In the Northern Hemisphere, that creates a clockwise spin, just like the pulley. That allows them to steer the upper level winds into nearly any configuration they wish. So the areas that are under that high pressure dome fry. They fry. Take a look at that round bubble. Is that not telling? That's a high pressure dome parked right over the top of us that ensures nothing, nothing can flow in. You would never see this meteorologically 20 years ago. Never. When you have two things that have the same mechanism of action, one would expect that their effects would be either additive or more than additive, that being synergistic. So we're talking about weather patterns. So you have fog, you have water droplets, you have water in the air. When those water droplets are irradiated with microwaves, they're going to do the same thing they do in our body. They're going to generate reactive oxygen species. And when nanoparticles are in that water, they're going to do the same thing they do in our body. They're going to generate reactive oxygen species. So at minimum, one would expect that these effects would be additive with the possibility that it could be more than additive. And if frequencies do that to particulates, again, what's it doing to us? What's it doing to the web of life? Given anything that's alive has water in it in some form or another, what's happening to us with this? And watch what happens to a flow of water when it's exposed to frequency. Very hard to believe. And when you feel that with particulates, the effect is even more profound. There's a radio frequency transmitter that, based on the signal transmission direction, is isolating precipitation and blocking out a whole section of precipitation. These are one of the radio frequency transmitters and they're being put up all over the country, all over the world, wherever the grid power will support them. Again, you saw the radio frequency transmission carving out a 90 degree inside corner. That's the overall effect in the end. Completely unnatural, there's not a meteorologist that doesn't know this is going on. No chance. Many ask this question, can cyclones, can hurricanes be manipulated? The short answer is yes. Project Cirrus, the US military has been engaged in hurricane manipulation programs since at least 1947. And these programs have been ongoing ever since, although the U.S. military denies it. They claim they stopped this research. That is a blatant lie. GeoengineWatch.org has captured film footage of the radio frequency transmissions being used to manipulate the atmospheric particulates sprayed by climate engineering operations in order to steer and direct hurricanes. They can be manipulated to a degree that few can comprehend. We have NASA satellite images available at geoengineeringwatch.org that show extraordinary atmospheric manipulation off the west coast of Africa where cyclones in the Atlantic Basin originate. 
There's no theory, there's no hypothesis, there's no conjecture. Cyclone manipulation is absolutely, positively being done. Some of this technology actually came out of the stealth program. Stealth was the idea that you would try to reduce the amount of radar energy that would be reflected off of an aircraft. You could put particles of metal into the paint itself. These particles would then absorb the energy. But if you put that up into the air and then you broadcast a signal that is tuned to the exact frequency that matches the size, and this is the key, all of these particles are the same exact size, so they respond to a specific frequency. So when you transmit this frequency, you can get all those particles to heat up. And if that mass of air has moisture in it, any kind of humidity at all, it all rises and expands. So this is how you can actually generate a weather system. A primary aspect of climate engineering is the climate engineer's ability to manufacture winter weather with patented processes of chemical ice nucleation for weather modification. In doing so, they can seed cloud moisture with what is termed endothermic reacting elements, energy absorbing elements that create a cold, dense layer of air that sinks to the surface of the planet and creates a shallow layer of cold, perhaps a few hundred feet thick, that creates the illusion of winter weather on a planet that's in total meltdown. So the surface temperatures are in fact very cold, sometimes astoundingly cold, but it's a shallow surface layer. Manufacturing winter weather events that are then sensationalized by corporate media dividing the population again, confusing them as to the true state of the planet and the true temperatures on planet Earth. They have focused oftentimes on particular regions like in 2014 in Boston on the east coast of the US, creating snowstorm after snowstorm after snowstorm with chemically nucleated moisture and creating sensationalized headlines from that event. 100 million Americans have been hit by a winter storm packing pretty much everything in the weather arsenal. And convincing much of the population that there was nothing wrong with the climate, that there was in fact record cold in some places, and thus in places where there was record warmth even during winter months, people tend to ignore that. As the planetary warming becomes a runaway event, the chemical ice nucleation elements that have been seeded into cloud moisture reach the surface before freezing. Thus, so-called frozen rain and ice storms are increasingly becoming the norm. How many know of the ice balls showing up on the shores of Lake Michigan, covering beaches, often 75 pounds or more, occurring at times on water that is 40 degrees plus Fahrenheit? How does that happen from chemical ice nucleation? This is nothing short of winter weather warfare, complete with destructive ice accumulations from the chemical ice nucleation cloud seeding and dangerously slick snow-like frozen material that contains surfactants they're used in climate engineering chemical ice nucleation cloud seeding operations in order to reduce particle coagulation, i.e. to keep the climate engineering elements from sticking together and forming larger particulates that would sink faster to the planet, which would not be conductive to the winter weather warfare scenario. The cryosphere, Earth's ice deposits, are melting at a pace that is unprecedented in the geologic past. The true magnitude of the planetary meltdown has been masked by statistical falsification. The climate engineers have attempted to hide this fact from populations. In order to mask the true severity of polar meltdown from populations, the climate engineers have utilized methods of sea surface ice nucleation. The effect of these operations can easily be distinguished on satellite images. The paradox with sea surface ice nucleation is this. The climate engineers are actually putting a lid or a cap on oceans that are already too warm for natural ice nucleation to occur. In doing so, the climate engineers are, in effect, sealing the heat in the oceans, thus increasing the overall heating of the planet. It's another larger specimen of black oak. It's mid-February. It's already leafing out. It's two months ahead of when it should be leafing out. The leaves last fall stayed on the trees and in late November, December, when a certain series of rains comes, we've seen this the last four years, all the leaves on the deciduous trees wad up dead, but still hang on the tree. As you see lower down on this tree, that's what we have. It appears to us as if some sort of defoliant is included in the aerosol spray mix and we know fruit farmers have been using 
this type of method to cause their orchards to go dormant for years. This is because the temperatures have been rising so progressively. Defoliants remove the foliage or leaves from the plant. A week after defoliation spraying, the plants stand dry and almost leafless. Defoliation, a maneuver designed to peel back the cover from which the Viet Cong spring ambushes on allied supply convoys and troop movements. Decomposition of forest floor duff, the materials on the forest floor, leaves, pine needles, twigs and sticks, is now almost non-existent. The soil microbiome has been devastated. The root systems of trees and forest flora are dying off, just as the crowns of the trees are also dying off. Climate engineering contamination is not only killing soil microorganisms, it is also causing trees to shut down nutrient uptake, which in turn initiates a slow, protracted death of the forest. Because of Earth's collapsing ozone layer, intense UV radiation is causing the stomata, the respiratory ports of trees, to shut down. Thus, trees don't respirate. They can't feed. They're simply dormant. The forest no longer smells like a forest because the trees are not breathing. Even during the spring and summer months, an increasing number of trees are growthless. What we are left with is stagnant, silent, dry, dead, and dying forests that are just a spark away from total incineration. Every single person that I've talked to so far has made the mention that I don't know why it's doing what it's doing. It's burning differently. It's burning uh, more aggressive um, than, than it has in years past. And I know we say that every year, but it, it's, it's unprecedented. It's burning in every direction all at the same time. The single greatest factor that is creating the conditions for the unprecedented wildfires all over the globe is climate engineering. Why? Because climate engineering is disrupting the hydrological cycle, i.e. the rain cycle. Climate engineering is destroying the ozone layer, which is bombarding forests with incredibly intense UV radiation, killing them from the top down. Climate engineering is ionizing the atmosphere, making it more electrically conductive, and this in turn facilitates more dry lightning, igniting yet more fires. Climate engineering is blanketing forest foliage and forest floors with a highly incendiary dust, aluminum nanoparticulates, barium, polymers, this further adds to the flammability of the forest. From every conceivable direction, climate engineering is the single greatest causal factor in regard to the epic forest fires that are consuming forests all over the globe. The equilibrium of our planet has been completely obliterated. And there are now feedback loops that have been triggered, as many as 50. It means once you knock a domino over, that domino knocks over a larger domino and still a larger domino, and the process continues, and that is now occurring on planet Earth. And now we have methane releasing from formerly frozen methane hydrate deposits all over the globe in Siberian tundra on the Arctic seafloor. Methane is escaping, rising into the atmosphere, and covering the planet like a layer of glass. Methane over a 10-year time horizon is from 100 to 120 times more potent than CO2 as a greenhouse gas. There's enough methane in these deposits to turn our planet into Venus many times over, and it is releasing now. And climate engineering, in the attempt to mask what is unfolding, has actually further fueled the process. Climate engineering alters upper level wind currents. That in turn alters ocean currents. Now we have warm water pumping into the Arctic in places it should not be, causing massive methane blowouts that have to be seen to be believed. They can be seen when they occur on terrestrial areas like the Siberian tundra. Massive craters that look like something from a massive nuclear war. The question is that people should be asking is if this is going on, why is nobody talking about it? Under the security classifications that a program can have directed upon it, it can keep it in a narrow vein and keep transparency away totally, absolutely. And the same can be with the contractors and subcontractors that work on the same program. That is to be expected. Any contractor that deals with a classified program will be as compartmentalized as the government program office is. That's the whole purpose. The ground rules are the same. 
In fact, you can't even bring that home and talk about it with your family or your friends or other work parties that are not also cleared on that specific program, whatever program that is. You only are told what you need to know. And so they assume that most people don't need to know anything and uh, the rest to only know a little bit, except the people who are pulling the strings. Many ask why environmental groups are not addressing the climate engineering issue. They appear to be more concerned about protecting their 501c3 nonprofit than they are about protecting the environment. Ignoring and obfuscating the truth about verifiable sources of damage to the environment is not protection. This is total betrayal. It's the same fraudulent behavior we see from every large corporation on the planet towing the line for the power structure while decimating the entire biosphere in the process. Turning two blind eyes to this situation will not save us from the reality of the near-term impact we are facing. Here's the bottom line. There can be no legitimate discussion about the climate or the state of the climate without first and foremost including the climate engineering issue. We do not have political representation for anybody being interested in saving this planet. And that is something I cannot understand. There is a, an ever increasing unhealthy cooperation between really all of the major media and the forces behind the scenes that are responsible for the environmental destruction. So many people try to deny that these programs could be occurring because they claim if they were occurring, there would be people lining up to blow the whistle. And that is so utterly and totally false when we know that with modern day surveillance, every word that anybody of significance says is recorded somewhere by someone. And when we know what happens to whistleblowers like Julian Assange, why would anyone line up to put their own neck on the block to blow the whistle on these types of programs, knowing that it will at minimum destroy their life. Even though half the pages were blanked out completely and others partially, uh, the fact that they provided me this information and acknowledged, yes, they were, they were aware, it's geoengineering, it, uh, they were aware, they knew it was happening and they were monitoring and part of it in that respect. So it's happening, no doubt about it. If these programs were in any sense benevolence. Why would there be an illegal federal gag order right now on all National Weather Service and all NOAA employees, the nation's weathermen, an illegal federal gag order? Well, that should tell you right away that all of this is happening at a really high level, obviously. So they won't take questions on it. They feed us BS information on what's going on. The people that are telling us what we ought to be doing are leading us astray. And there needs to be a comeuppance and a really good investigation of what's going on. If you look at the total wealth that we can create on planet Earth, if we create a financial system which supports life and is in alignment with life, what I will tell you is our current financial wealth is less than 1% of what's possible. We don't have economic problems on planet Earth. We have a political problem but that the economy is so suboptimized and that's because there is this force controlling it from top down. So whatever's going on, I say, tell the people because you know, the people can deal with it and the people can, whatever problem there is, they can deal with it or they can solve it. So I'm big on transparency and I know if enough people push for enough transparency, we can figure it out. Could a strange substance found by a Southwest Arkansas man be part of a government test? Fayetteville News 12 investigation reporter Jeff Farrell shows us the results of testing we had done about what's in our skies. They begin as normal contrails from a jet engine, but do not fade away like a normal contrail. KSLA News 12 had the sample tested at a lab. The results? A high level of barium, 6.8 parts per million more than three times the toxic level set by the EPA. We're um, just about ready to go into the clean room facility. We will be looking at uh, the samples uh, by scanning electron microscopy. The scanning electron microscopy will provide information about the particle size distribution. We will be able to get some elemental analysis. What really this uh, technique is for is to prioritize our samples for downstream 
more advanced imaging, more high resolution imaging, uh, especially by transmission electron microscopy. Put on a fresh pair of gloves. We're going to start with uh, sample number eight. This is a blank that was collected uh, on the return flight. Uh, no flow through this filter, so this filter should be free of any particulates. I'm going to use these uh, scissors and forceps that have been cleansed with um, isopropanol and then acetone, wipe free with these uh, dust-free cloths. These are the series of samples that we're interested in. These are samples number 9, 10, and 11. These were taken on the return flight where the plane passed through an induced uh, cloud layer. Um, number 10, I believe, is the one that was uh, passed through a cloud layer at around um, somewhere between 17 and 19,000 feet. I will uh, take time to cleanse the instruments between each sampling. Bearing sample number 9, near the center. Opening it to ensure that the surface that had received the particulates is facing upward. Number 9 is completed. Now processing sample number 10. One additional uh, sample, this uh, blank sample uh, was taken after the uh, plane landed in three of the samples containing actual airflow particulates uh, had been collected. So we have one prior to the mission and one at the conclusion of the mission. Prior to imaging, these samples are coated with a thin layer of uh, platinum. The platinum helps to take the excess charge or electrons and drain them off to the stub. And now uh, we'll do the samples where we pass through the cloud layer. A few little bright particles. This particle here is probably the one that we'll do the most analysis on. So the general image that we're seeing now are the glass fibers from the glass fiber filter itself. And the bright particles or bright areas that we see are areas operating in the so-called backscatter mode of this microscope, um, collects electrons that are backscattered, especially from metal center compounds. But you can clearly see the uh, lighter and darker uh, contrasted areas there, suggesting that it's an aggregate. Mm -hmm. Some of the smaller particles in here we're looking at on the inner, uh, order of about 450 nanometers long. But there's also smaller particles in yeah. there too. So backscattered electrons, typically the higher the atomic number, the brighter the signal. That being said, what we will do is look for the bright spots and then analyze those. The glass itself does seem to have sodium in it. Um, looks like aluminum, sodium, silicon, um, calcium, potassium. Mm -hmm. So the reason that caught my eye is because it's darker than everything else. And it's got lots of small particles in it. Yep. And this gives us a lot of information. Again, it um, identifies which uh, filters have qualitatively more materials. Just, you know, mm -hmm. basically we see more material on it. Um, it also gives us information about size of particles and potential for aggregates that we might be uh, yeah. dealing with in the samples. Barium sulfide again. So barium sulfide is interesting. What he's doing now is uh, just getting a higher resolution image of it to see if this is indeed a single particle or if there's any evidence that there's an aggregate of uh, smaller particles. So really the big standout in this one seems to be iron. 
in this field we have one, one there, mm -hmm. two, three, four. Yeah. And I did an and I did analysis on all of them. Mm -hmm. Um, they all seem to be pretty similar in composition. Yeah. Well, this is definitely made up of much smaller particles. Yeah. So this may be a clump of what you're looking yeah. for. Yeah. We just analyzed three different areas. Um, this particle seems to be high in aluminum. It's a large <laughs> flake, joke. though. And this has some silver, too. Yeah, in terms of now the alumina, like aluminum signatures that we're getting from the glass fibers themselves. This, this is much is bigger. Much, much bigger. So, so look at that. Yeah, that's so the aluminum. It's easily 3x the silicon. Yeah. And I think the silicon and aluminum are pretty similar in the glass. Thoroughly so here, if you look at dull. just the glass fiber, silicon is significantly taller than aluminum. So that particle there is mostly aluminum. Yeah. So yeah, measuring this one right here, this is below 70 nanometers. Right. Good. In okay. the precipitation samples that we've seen in the past, uh, the aluminum oxide particles that we've been seeing are there on the order of 40 to 60 nanometers. So that's consistent with the size that we've seen from precipitation events. Again, these samples were collected directly from the air. There's not a lot of approaches or instrumentation that you can use to observe these nanomaterials. I mean, again, these are the sizes of viruses. And so really the only equipment or instrumentation that is appropriate for identifying these materials is a high resolution transmission electron microscopy. This allows us not only to determine the size of the particles, we can also determine the composition using a technique called elemental dispersive spectroscopy. It's uh, done within this large microscope. So it will give us information about the morphology of the particles, the composition of the particles, and we can actually see the crystalline spacing, so the spaces of the crystals themselves. So we are talking high resolution microscopic techniques that are really the only way to be able to observe these directly. Morphology is important because the productions of these materials are really of a constrained size range and we've seen this already in samples that we've analyzed from other sources. American Element produces lots of these nanomaterials and you can actually purchase them online. The size distribution of these engineered particles are quite homogeneous. Yeah. Now, what I've done is tell it to calibrate to the aluminum peak. So now what it's doing is going through each of its process times and each of its gain values and calibrate. Oh man, I can tell you this much. What I'm seeing right now is far superior to the last time I ran the calibration. So you see you got two calciums, right? Yeah. All right. K alpha, K beta. Right? This barium peak is probably an L and an M. Here's your major barium. Yeah, and then you have the other right there. Correct. Barium is a triple popular. It's definitely yeah. 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 Oh yeah, yeah. The significance of the results is that to my knowledge, this is the first evidence of nanomaterials collected directly from the emissions of aircrafts. This is the first time that this has been reported or acknowledged. There is aluminum and there is aluminum. You know, so the way the people are involved in the destruction of our beautiful planet, they get away with it is because the crust of the earth consists of aluminum silicate. Although traces of aluminum may be found in almost any soil, only those clays containing 50 or 60 percent aluminum ore and known as bauxite are mined for commercial production. And so their argument is always, well, we always had aluminum in the system and our body knows how to deal with it. Well, there's a difference between creating nanonized nanoparticles of aluminum which do not exist in nature 
uh, which is a highly aggressive material that is seeking to chemically react with other things. The chemical process reaches its climax in these huge tanks where alumina is precipitated out of the ore in caustic solution. Later, the water content is driven off by baking in giant rotary kilns, resulting in this pure snow-white powder known as alumina. An ever-increasing amount of this alumina is being used in chemical processing, in soil conditioners, in abrasives, and many other applications. Aluminum particles are highly reflective and thus serve the stated agendas of the climate engineers, reducing direct sunlight. The nanoparticles of aluminum are also powerful desiccants, absorbing atmospheric moisture, reducing atmospheric relative humidity, derailing and disrupting the entire global hydrological cycle. Nanoparticulates of different materials are produced for lots of different reasons. In fact, they're in cosmetics, uh, titanium oxide nanoparticles used for um, sunscreen, zinc oxide. So they're not a new invention. What has happened recently, and again, my knowledge is primarily the, the medical and, and health effects studies, uh, is that we've learned to manipulate and create nanoparticles for specific design purposes. We have exploding amount of national laboratory facilities which are researching just the nanomaterials. And it's scary because every single one of them, first of all, is toxic to human body. And second, it absorbs the gigahertz range radiation. Every single nanoparticle absorbs gigahertz radiation. Nanoparticle has nothing to do with the original material where it stems from. So aluminum in nanoform, you can literally explode it. It can be ignited at much, much lower temperature. In this form, another unusual property of aluminum appears. Suspended in a paint vehicle, the powdered particles float to the surface and form a continuous layer of aluminum over the area being covered. This aluminum shield provides protection from weather, and reflects light and heat almost as effectively as a solid sheet of aluminum. Aluminum is one of the two metals, iron and aluminum, that exist in a three plus state. The each plus means lacking an electron. And so aluminum salts are the most electron deficient metal. And with that highly, highly reactive to the proteins inside our cells, which are loaded with electrons. And so aluminum makes very, very strong bonds with the proteins in our cell, which means a protein that has incorporated aluminum becomes a dysfunctional protein that no longer works. We have about 200,000 working proteins in the body. That's what creates your testosterone. That's what creates your, your insulin. Yeah, this is all made by intracellular proteins. And those get contaminated with the aluminum and become highly dysfunctional. No creature has ever been found to utilize aluminum. There is no creature, no virus, no bacteria, no fungus, nothing that thrives on aluminum. It's deadly to all life on Earth. In national defense, as in many other fields, aluminum is everywhere. In the air, on the ground, and on the sea, versatile aluminum serves our fighting men. And this is the thing about the constituents used in geoengineering, is they are similar to items that are going in ground operations. So whether you're sanding aircraft parts that can stain tr strontium chromate, changing brake pads, working around barium, um, bending aluminum metals for different aircraft parts. This could all be explained as to their exposures. But the question is, those that don't work in those areas that are showing these symptoms, where's it coming from? I think in the next couple of hours, we'll see that actually open up a bit before the clouds start to return a bit. That's the high cloudiness we're being sprayed uh, up from the north. Uh, there's uh, more upstream, though, for us later on this afternoon into this evening.
that uh, we've been dealing a lot with some military activity in terms of chaff anyway and that's something that I experienced for the first time yesterday that was a whole lot of fun and that's where the military just basically dumps uh, some of the, the, the tiny particles of plastic or um, metal mylar into the atmosphere and when you see this kind of a pattern like this you can rest assured there's something going on they're actually little bitty magnetic and little bitty strips of whether it's aluminum then you see these bands of very distinct cloud cover moving into the region. That is not rain, that is not snow. Believe it or not, military aircraft flying through the region is dropping chaff. Small bits of aluminum, sometimes it's made of plastic or uh, even uh, metallicized, uh, metallicized paper products, but it's used as an anti-radar issue and obviously they're up there practicing. Now they won't confirm that, but I was in the Marine Corps for many years and I'll tell you right now, that's what it is. So we conducted the analyses of these nanomaterials and conclusively confirmed that there were aluminum oxide, barium sulfate nanoparticles in the samples that we took on the East Coast on that second flight. For my mind, that would be sufficient, but I'm also was quite interested in, well, what's going on the West Coast? Are these similar types of results can be collected in various regions? I was really thankful to be part of a third sampling mission. We flew from near San Diego up to the Bay Area and back on one of these days where, again, there was clear evidence of patterned skies being induced by the emissions of the aircrafts. In this uh, sampling mission, there was a couple of different things. One is that we used a Learjet. It's a pressurized cabin for one thing. We can get to higher altitudes. It's much quicker. And we used instrumentation that was appropriate for smaller particulates. We had instruments to monitor the air quality in real time. We had two particle meters on board, one that measured PM 2.5, so that would be relatively large particles that we're normally concerned about, these respirable particles that get into our lungs. But we also had on board a particle meter that went down to 20 nanometers. So that meter combined with the larger particle meter gave us a full assessment of materials ranging from 20 nanometers up to 2.5 microns. Our filters that we use were 0.1 micron, so that's 100 nanometer pore size that would capture many more of the nanomaterials that were being released. What we're breathing in pressurized cabins is actually air from the outside is being taken in in front of the engines. Some of the airstream goes into the engine to feed the combustion process, and then bleed air then off of that is taken directly from the outside, pressurized, and then is used to pressurize the cabin. And we could sample it right from the vents. So we had a sampling wand that we could hold up to the vent, and uh, the sampling wand was sampling for the ultrafine particles. We sampled through one of these confluent layers and as we pass through that layer, the larger particle meter basically read just ambient air within the cabin. With regard to the nanoparticle meter, there was clear evidence that there were smaller particles at significant numbers present within that layer. And that is significant. I mean, this is not only just the number of particles that we observed, but also that they were confined to that smaller size range. Above the layer, again, the air quality was quite good. Below the layer, air quality was quite good in, with regard to the smaller nanoparticle meters. But within that layer, there was clear evidence that there were smaller particles at significant numbers present within that layer. It has significance because this emerging condition known as aerotoxic syndrome, where airline attendants, pilots, people are becoming allergic to their own aircrafts. There really hasn't been identified any known cause of this phenomenon, but nanoparticles of that type can cause things like allergic reactions. These same symptoms that are being experienced by all of these people in the airline industry now. The data that we collected using the particle meter is already convincing in terms of there are nanoparticles that are present within that induced layer. What is needed now is a larger contribution from a broader community of scientists, health workers. However, that takes time. And in my opinion, we don't have that kind of time. These materials will reside in our children for their entire life, however long or short that might be. So we don't really have time 
to say, oh, more research is needed, although it is needed, but not at the same time as we continue to disperse these materials and affect our human population. In the East and in the West, large forest land areas have been sprayed to kill destructive insects. This work by airplanes is significant. It has an indirect effect on all Americans. Here's one to keep track of over here. Notice it didn't have yeah. anything coming out of it. Yeah, he just turned on. He just turned on his spray. With commercial airlines, you're not gonna get this kind of converging intersection, I mean, even though they're at different altitudes. But the important thing to consider, there's not a natural cloud in the sky. Everything in the sky is an aerosol out of the back of an aircraft. Anybody who says that can't affect the weather is, is simply ignoring logic and reality. My rock climber's mentality says, you have to face reality. You just have to face reality. Or if you don't, you could end up at the bottom of a cliff because gravity will take you there. When I see El Capitan over there looming in the distance, and I think about the times, of, I feel what this place has given me is so much as a human being to experience life. You can't not care. You have to care about it. You can't not care. You can't not care. That is, that is not human. That's a human who's been conditioned to no longer be a human being. With all the spray that's been up, put up in our atmosphere, it, it apparently has come down and it's affecting the environment. You see all the trees that are dead and in the process of dying right now, flashing out. You can see the, the really brown ones that have just flashed out with the needle still on them. It's progressing throughout the whole hillside. Even on the top slope, if you, if you look to the back slope up there, I mean, they're flashing out everywhere. That's right. You don't have any kind of uniform green. You have just various colors of dead yeah. and dying. That's all you have. What a thought that we're standing here at this point in history, dealing with this madness. Maybe two years from now, we won't even be able to stand here. It's been proven this is happening throughout this country and around the world. This is supposed to be Yosemite, and a national treasure, world heritage site. You want to take a picture? What are you going to see? Climate engineering operations are saturating our atmosphere with light scattering particles that alters the light spectrum that reaches the surface of the planet. This in turn affects photosynthesis. The sunlight that is going through this layer piggybacks the frequency of those toxins when you're exposed to the sun, when there is that gray halo between you and the sun, the sunlight burns and it feels very, very unpleasant, and you end up feeling miserable at the end of the day. Whereas when the sun goes through a clear blue sky, you may get a sunburn if you stay there too long, but it's a pleasant warmth that you're getting. We've been told that the ozone layer is recovering, but that's a blatant lie. That's a cover-up. We're being bombarded with very dangerous levels of UV radiation, not just UVA and UVB, but UVC, the last spectrum of UV radiation before X-ray. So if we have 10.5 milliwatts per centimeter squared and we subtract the UVA, which I believe was 4.3 milliwatts per centimeter squared, we end up with about 60% of the total incoming UV is UVB. And that's simply off the charts. It is well known and understood in the science community that climate engineering operations would damage the ozone layer. But because the science community is betraying the human race and the entire web of life, they are not admitting that these operations have long since been deployed and are destroying the ozone layer. And when people feel how intense the sun feels in their skin, it is not their imagination. Extreme UV radiation is killing plankton. Plankton populations globally are plummeting. At this point in time, plankton is the single largest oxygen producer on the planet. No plankton, no people. Climate engineering from every conceivable direction is pounding the nails into our collective coffins. In order to try to understand what was going on with the bombardment of nanoparticles, I decided to test lichens. Now, environmentally, lichens only get their nutrients and energy from the air and from rain. I tested and found that the most common uh, element uh, found was aluminum. There are a number of things that happen with aluminum saturation. And rather than acidic, it creates a, a basic formula in the soil which favors some plants and destroys others. In root systems, it can have a significant impact on their absorption and nutrient uptake. The pH of the rain 
is 10 times more alkaline than it used to. The pH of the soil is 10 times more alkaline than it used to. For acid soils, they've gone neutral. It hasn't gone much past neutral, but it's still 10 times more alkaline than it should be. The soil has been the most destructed entity on the planet. We know that the soil contains tens of thousands of different species of microbes, bacteria, fungi, helminth, viruses, that are absolutely essential for the soil to produce food that actually nurtures us. A lot of work has been done on tobacco and wheat and rye grasses, that germination of seeds in the presence of nanomaterials, of aluminum oxide, for instance, significantly stunts root growth and leads to a plant that has been compromised. Most of the oxygen that's being produced by our planet is produced by things like trees and algae and cyanobacteria. All of these life forms are negatively impacted by exposure to nanoparticles of aluminum oxide and other nanomaterials. You see smaller plants in front with the very discolored leaves. That's fungal infection. As the bioavailable metals are killing soil microbes, changing soil pHs, changing forest soil compositions, it has a horrific domino effect. Whole specimens, mature specimens of manzanita flash out stone dead black from fungal infection. In the geoengineering mix, you know, these are nanoplastic particles that are spiked with aluminum, with titanium, with strontium. Basically, the oceans are covered with a sheet of plastic. The oceans can no longer evaporate the water that the atmosphere needs to keep the earth blue and green like it used to be. The algae in the ocean depend on a lot of sunlight in order to produce oxygen. And they can't do their job anymore because they're not getting the light they need. In the last two or three years, ever increasing articles about nanoplastics appearing in chicken, in fruit, in vegetables, and also in our human body. Every animal that we eat now is full of these nanoplastic particles. And these are certainly not animals that have swum in the ocean. <laughs> these are land-based animals. They never eat in a plastic bag, and yet they're accumulating these nanoparticles. And the only possible source of that is the air that they breathe. At this late hour on our planet, when we most need alternative forms of energy, climate engineering is dramatically diminishing all three primary forms of alternative energy. Climate engineering is disrupting the hydrological cycle, i.e. the rain cycle, causing protracted droughts all over the world, which is dramatically reducing hydropower production. Climate engineering, by its very description, solar radiation management to block the sun, greatly diminishes solar power output all over the world. Climate engineering also reduces wind power because it reduces convection. Atmospheric layers of reflective particles reduce convection, which in turn reduces wind, which reduces evaporation, again decreasing potential power output for all other forms of energy. Many are absolutely overwhelmed when they are introduced to the climate engineering issue. They try to convince themselves that our government would never do this to us. But such a conclusion doesn't hold up to available data. All official air testing agencies generally test for 10 microns, 2.5 microns at best. Atmospheric testing has proven that climate engineering aerosols are unimaginably smaller in the 20 to 100 nanometer range. The smaller the particle, the more deadly it is to inhale. Available science studies prove that human hearts and human brains now have not just millions, but billions of nanoparticles lodged in them. Most know that bee colonies are collapsing. What most don't know is that insect populations in general are also collapsing all over the world. Bees are dying of symptoms resembling Alzheimer's and dementia in human beings because they're packed full of aluminum. Why aren't the beekeepers acknowledging this? Why isn't this fact a headline all over the globe? To suit our convenience, we clear other large areas of natural life in order to build towns and cities. 
our homes, stores, and factories clustered closely together are easy marks continually tempting invasion by the insect enemies. Our only answer is to wage constant battle with the bugs. This must be intelligent, organized, well-planned warfare. We must fight our insect enemies with every weapon our imagination and science can devise. Chemical warfare is quick death to our enemies, whether used on a small scale or on a large scale. Vast areas can be treated in a short time, an outstanding advantage in our warfare against the insects. What's it like for an insect to be poisoned by a crop-dusting aircraft? Don't we all know? Is there any difference whatsoever between crop dusting insects and the global climate engineering spray operations that have long since contaminated our entire planet and every breath we take? How can we avoid this? Answer, we can't. You can make very high quality and do this in just a jet in a very simple way, make high quality aluminum particles just by spraying aluminum vapor out which oxidizes. And implementation decisions will be risk to risk decisions. The risk of doing it against the risk of not doing it. It's very good to have research on new applications of technology that are beneficial. But it should be balanced at the same time it's developed with the study of the adverse effects, if there are any. Now, as it happens, the Air Force conducted a study starting in 1993. It was called In Vitro Toxicity of Aluminum Nanoparticles in Rat alveolar macrophages. That's a real fancy way of saying testing the effect of aluminum nanoparticles on the white blood cells in the little air sacs in your lung, the alveoli. And what they found in this eight-year study was that these particles, when you're exposed to long enough, it suppresses the ability of your white blood cells to defend you from airborne infections coming into your lungs. And so essentially by breathing this material in, your immune system is dramatically suppressed. If we can't breathe, if we can't inhale without sucking up highly toxic bioavailable, bioaccumulative particulates that lodge in our systems like a plaque, elements like aluminum, barium, strontium, elements that are highly toxic in and of themselves, but when combined become exponentially more toxic. 70% of the nanoparticles that are already within us are introduced to our systems through just respiration. So we breathe them into our nose, the ethmoidal sinuses then collect them, they can migrate to our frontal lobe through the olfactory nerve, and there they can generate reactive oxygen species and cause brain damages of different type. Everything we know at present suggests that generation of reactive oxygen species is the cause of aging, cause of almost every disease that we know. Certainly dementia, but, but other diseases as well. A lot of the nanoparticles, not all of them, but a lot of them have metal ions. Metal ions are potent generators of reactive oxygen species. When you have nanoparticles in the body, they are small enough so they go everywhere. There is no barrier to them in any part of the body. They cross the blood-brain barrier, they cross cell membranes, they're even more reactive or can be more damaging than virus particles. We have natural defenses against viruses. We have no natural defenses against nanomaterials. And again, they never leave our system. They don't die. They're not cleared. We don't produce antibodies against them. So we are exposing humanity to a class of materials that will continue to damage biological tissue for the lifetime of that organism. The Japanese developed a blood washing method called aphoresis that was used for reducing cholesterol and fats from the blood. And then a brilliant German toxicologist came along and modified this procedure where he could not only wash out the blood, but also the plasma from the connective tissue, which is a much deeper look into the system. The entire blood volume and plasma volume is put through a filter system several times and filters out anything that's toxic. And with this method, it's the first time you can actually measure body burden, or how much is in the entire body. And as it turns out, nanonized aluminum is by a factor 
of roughly 100 times, 94 to 120 times more prevalent than any other toxin, nanonized aluminum. And we know that we absorb aluminum very poorly by eating it. That cannot be the possible route how we get toxic. The only way that we can get these high levels of aluminum is through inhalation or through injection. This was a, a big wake-up call. To let the involvement of a program impact my grandchildren, my even my children, not necessarily the immediate years for myself, is a very personal concern to know how it will flow down through the elements of the family. I often find that those who question actions of the government often don't want to get involved until it directly affects them. If you look up into the sky, this is directly affecting you. If you have a family, your children, your wife, your husband, your extended family members, your animals, this is directly affecting all of us. How can so many claim that governments and militaries around the world would not spray chemical and biological agents on populations when there are, are literally hundreds of historically documented cases of such operations occurring in recent decades. Many biological warfare experiments were officially used to test the range and dispersal patterns of aerosol, particulates, and biological agents. In the United States alone, by 1977, 239 open-air biological tests had been conducted over unknowing U.S. populations. Tests were conducted throughout the 20th century, many of which took place concurrently with the covert ramp-up of climate engineering operations. We are expected to believe that this experimentation was benign and not connected to the climate engineering operations just as is the case with the ever-increasing exposure to microwave transmissions all over the world. Many of what we are told are only cellular communication towers have power supply inputs that are 10 times larger than what is needed for communications purposes. The compounding synergistic toxicity of these operations is accumulating inside all of us. What makes us sensitive to Wi-Fi and to the electromagnetic radiation in general is the metals in our body. And we never used to have aluminum in our mitochondria. The aluminum in our mitochondria makes the inside of the mitochondria resonant with Wi-Fi and they start heating up and it starts destroying the mitochondrial DNA at a very, very rapid rate. And so it's really the synergy of the metals dispersed in our body and the Wi-Fi making our body a resonant antenna with the Wi-Fi environment. And of course, you, you know, we're going now from 3 or 4G to 5G with the ever increasing amplitude of energy that's delivered into our systems. This is one of those life or death choices, but we're not just talking about my life or your life. We're talking about something that is killing the fundamental living system on the planet. We are bathed now in a soup that is comprised of nanonized aluminum. Glyphosate forms six different salts with aluminum and works as a carrier to carry the aluminum deep into our brains. And uh, the only other missing thing there was to open the cell walls, open the blood-brain barrier, is the ever-increasing exposure to radio waves. Half of the people listening to this talk will die with or off dementia. And the main cause of dementia is the nanonized aluminum particles. There's somebody behind the scene orchestrating that with the perfect understanding of the human condition and of toxicology and brought the three things together that will, in a very, very rapid period of time, we're talking six, seven years from here on, cause major destruction of the human nervous system that could be stopped at a switch. We could have a clean world tomorrow.
we need to come together for all of humanity to address this issue. And I think that the only way to do that at this point is a legal approach and to present all evidence on both sides, the evidence that we are collecting as independent scientists and the evidence that already exists in those laboratories where these materials are produced and deployed. Colleagues of mine, they don't really accept this yet. They're starting to because I've shared some of the data that we've collected, but most of them will ignore it and, and do call it beat up conspiracy theories. Well, those learned people are ignorant of the facts. And so my call to action is don't ignore things anymore. You know, we have to address this issue. It's, it's in, on our doorstep, it's in our skies, it's in our children. We have to do something. If the ongoing global climate engineering weather warfare operations are not brought to light and to a halt, allowing the planet to respond to the damage done, it will never be able to find a new equilibrium, an equilibrium that may yet allow it to sustain life into the future. Exposing and halting climate engineering operations is the great imperative. They are disrupting virtually the entire web of life. I think we need to enlist the uh, support of uh, commercial airline pilots, as well as calling back and bringing these subject up with our House and Senate members in the U.S. Congress. I think it's going to take that kind of action to uh, get this geoengineering exposed, find out what's behind it and why they are doing this. In my life, I have friends, family, wonderful people who are trying to stay within the official reality on the theory that they'll be safer. And the reality is, if you look at where this thing is going, you know, better we deal with it now, it's like cancer, it's only gonna get worse. The data is what's gonna change people's mind. So you need to be able to draw it out, get the reports available, and get publicity on what the conclusions are so that people believe it. It's not just someone raising a subject that has no validity. It's based on scientific data that demands changes. We've gotten to the point where the mystery is so expensive, spiritually, psychologically, financially, legally, you know, that the time has come to say is, you know, who's really doing this and why are they behaving this way? And I often wonder, do any of those people, you know, behind the scenes fearing reprisal, are they looking into this? There is data out there. Who's gonna bring it forward? We are rapidly running out of time to take care of this problem. That's what makes it so critical. Yeah, and I can only hope that in my lifetime, we'll have a resolution of this and we, and we can fix it. I'd really like to see the planet stay, the life on the planet stay anyway. How do we stop climate engineering? I've asked this question so often. The only way forward in this fight, the only way we can expose and halt climate engineering is from the inside out. With a critical mass of awareness, a level of awareness so vast that it causes a shockwave around the world so that populations all over the world know what their governments have done to them without their knowledge or consent. A level of awareness so vast that our military brothers and sisters and their families understand what they are really a part of, literally self-extermination. We must reach a critical mass of awareness. It is the only way we can expose and halt climate engineering processes, and this effort will take all of us. You cannot change anything when you are dead. When you are dead, it's always gone. So as long as you are alive, do something, I would say. I do trust human ingenuity and human intelligence. And I think we still have a chance, but things are far more serious than the general public is aware of. The song is going to be over very soon if you don't turn things around. We have a system full of great pain and great suffering and great poverty. And, you know, people sort of walking around in the dark playing bump bumper cars, it doesn't have to be. And so part of what has me so optimistic is I know what's possible. I know that what we have now is, is tiny compared to what's possible. So now's the time to figure out what's going on and why. Now, our only chance 
is to stop interfering with Earth's life support systems, to expose and halt climate engineering once and for all, allow the planet to respond to the damage done to it on its own. Climate engineering is not a cure. Climate engineering is a curse, even worse than the disease it claims to treat. Time is not on our side. The sand in the hourglass is running out at blinding speed. Please, make your voice heard. Make every day count. Please forgive me if I ran for a moment on the memories from my former life, my life before the last 20 years of my desperate attempt to sound the alarm. I spent so much time on or near the ocean. I got my scuba certification at age 14. Being below the waves was always an escape to another world, a world that still made sense, a world in which I often felt I wanted to remain. And I feel so fortunate to have seen and experienced life below the surface of the sea in numerous parts of the world, in the waters off New Zealand, Australia, in the South Seas, Fiji, the most remote locations in the Sea of Cortez, the Gulf of California. But the vast majority of my diving sabbaticals were around all the shores of the Channel Islands off the coast of California. And how incredibly miraculous and thriving were the once expansive kelp forests there. I would meander in total solitude through these mystical undersea landscapes that were teeming with life. When the water clarity was at its best, the visibility could be well over a hundred feet. And on such days, stunningly beautiful beams of sunlight would glisten down through the kelp stalks rising up from so far below me. It was like being in the canopy of a long lost medieval forest. And weaving my way through the massive kelp stalks in total silence, I felt like a wild and free bird flying through an untouched and unspoiled paradise of unimaginable beauty. So many species all playing their individual part in the miraculous web of life. Seals making their way through the kelp would often alter their course and they would swim up to me and stare right into my mask, directly into my eyes. They were curious. Many of my memories from the kelp forests now seem a very distant dream from another life. Moments that I knew, even while they were occurring, were slipping away. It was beautiful. It was nature. A part of the living ocean. A part of the web of life on which our lives depend. I had to leave that life. There was a constant calling of conscience inside me. I felt there was much I had to do, that there was a long journey before me yet to be traveled. The deepest and most untraveled wilderness has always been my sanctuary. And when I trek there alone and in solitude, I feel most connected to the whole. I marvel at the complexity and the miraculousness of life, the countless forms of it. I try to contemplate the endless and seemingly impossible factors that were necessary for life to exist and flourish on this spinning ball of rock in the harsh and hostile environment of space. A ball of rock with its own magnetic shield, with its own moon that stabilizes its orbit, that orbits a life-giving star at just the right distance with miraculous atmospheric layers that for unimaginably long spans of time have facilitated countless forms of life. How wondrous it all is, each part, a dragonfly, a tree, a bird, a whale, the sunrise, millions of tons of water magically floating through the sky in the form of spellbindingly beautiful clouds bringing life-giving rain. When I witness the destruction of this miraculous web of life, I can only think of returning to the front line of the battle to sound the alarm. Reaching a critical mass of awareness in the population is the only way forward in this fight. The challenges we face are immense. The odds are against us. But as the proverb goes, it's not over till it's over. Any one of us could be the final pebble that triggers the landslide of awakening.